Illinois lawmakers left Springfield on May 31st after passing a new budget, concealed carry legislation, and expanding the state's Medicaid system. But they'll be back in town later this month after failing to agree on how to fix the state's massive public pension problem. This is a special edition of Illinois Lawmakers. And we begin the program with State Representative John Bradley, Democrat of Marion, the Assistant House Majority Leader and Chairman of the House Revenue and Finance Committee. Good to have you back on the program. Great to be here, Jack. Thanks. The uh, governor has called the House and Senate back into special session on June 19th to take another run at trying to solve the state's pension problem. Uh, no success at the end of the session. Uh, where do we go from here? Well, the House passed five pension bills. My recollection, um, the pension system is unsustainable. It's going to collapse at some point. Um, we're attempting to keep the defined benefit plan, the defined benefit plan, which is uh, a better plan than most of the rest of the world has. Um, but it is a difficult situation, not one that uh, people in our generation created, but one that's been going on for decades, and it has to be resolved. I'm the son of teachers, and yet I'm also the chairman of revenue and finance, and the pension issue has to be resolved or there won't be any pension for anyone at some point in the future. Speaker Madigan, of course, passed a, uh, uh, an over, a comprehensive pen, uh, pension plan at the north, near the end of the session. The Senate uh, passed its own version that was ba uh, backed by the unions that are uh, represented in all this. Uh, the Speaker's plan went over to the Senate and it was dismally defeated. And now you've got this staring contest between the two chambers. Yeah, um, oftentimes on big issues, and this is not unusual, sometimes with the budget, sometimes on an issue like the pensions, uh, there'll be a lack of uh, reconciliation between the House and Senate. Eventually that will be resolved. Um, there have been proposals that have been sent from one chamber to the other. Uh, at some point there'll either be uh, an acceptance of that proposal by the other chamber or some kind of reconciliation. We did that with the budget uh, this year where we had competing ideas of exactly what the revenue was. We went back and looked at it, came up to a reconciliation of those and were able to pass the budget through both chambers. If you had to find, if you had to look for an area where the two houses could come to some kind of agreement and still save some money that will keep the pension uh, system solvent, what would it be? Well, that's the, <laughs> that's the 80, million, $80 billion question, Jack. <laughs> and so the House passed a bill which goes further than the Senate bill. The Senate bill passed a bill which relies on a concept known as consideration or offering choices. At the end of the day, though, what we have to remember, at, at the end of the day, the courts are going to decide this. So whatever proposal goes out of both chambers and is signed by the governor, it's still ultimately going to be the decision of the Illinois Supreme Court as to what happens. The governor was in the same situation last year and called everyone back in in August, and there did not appear to be a roadmap for that. As uh, we this, talk, uh, there doesn't appear to road, be a roadmap. This doesn't work. It's, it's all showbiz and politics, calling back the legislature without any plan or without any process in place. The work needs to be done, and then when you get the work done, and you get an agreement in place and you get um, a concept and a notion and you take a leadership role, then you call the legislature back and ask for official action. But you can't just call the legislature back for the purpose of media attention or, or showbiz. It's so, a waste of taxpayer dollars. The predecessor governor, Rob Lugoyevich, tried this many, many times and it doesn't work. So your sense would be <coughs> one of diminished expectations for June 19th? I'll, I'll be there, I'll report to duty, but it's time for the governor to take leadership and not simply call special sessions. A, uh, a budget was passed with Democratic votes in both the House and Senate, $35.4 billion. Is that sustainable given the current situation? Yes, in, in fact, I think it's still probably a conservative number. Um, we've been able to pay about three and a half billion dollars of old bills as a result of the April surprise that took place with increased revenues in the state. We have another 1.3 billion of old bill payments built into this year's uh, upcoming year's budget. So as a result of the efforts that began in the House Revenue and Finance Committee last year between Representative Harris and myself and keeping the, the spending down and having uh, revenue estimates that made sense, we were in a position where when we got extra money, we could pay old bills. The, uh, the House Republicans and Senate, uh, they, they basically say, you've got a bill there that's got $2 billion worth of new spending in it, and the situation is still pretty, well, pretty sad. We paid old bills, and when you go into the agencies and you talk to the agencies, there's not a lot of new spending in those agencies. If any, education, 
we restored the transportation funding for downstate school districts. I don't consider that a new program. I consider that honoring a promise that was made before. Um, so the Republicans participated up to a point. They participated up to a point. We made significant attempts to keep them in the budgeting process throughout the end, welcomed their participation, wanted their participation, um, and we asked for responses to proposals that were put out there, and we never got one, so we went forward and passed the budget. At this point, they're, they're, uh, one of the other big issues that was accomplished, you were one of the lead negotiators. You were the lead negotiator on the, uh, the new fracking bill for the oil and gas industry in the state. That was one of the success stories. And for the environmentalists and for the people of Southern Illinois and job creation and the uh, men and women, uh, working men and women of the state. I was part of a team that worked on that. Um, there was tens of people involved in the negotiations at any given time. We were able to forge a historic coalition of, of environmental groups, Sierra Club, NRDC, Environmental Law and Policy Center, um, as well as the oil and gas industry business, the AFL-CIO, the Illinois Farm Bureau, the Attorney General's Office, Department of Natural Resources, Environmental Protection <laughs> Agency. It was a historic compromise, creates the strongest regulations in the United States for the regulation of horizontal hydraulic fracturing. It's already taken place in the state of Illinois. So without these regulations, our environment and our communities are not protected. With these regulations in place, we have the most significant protections in the United States. And yet to close, we still have a number of counties that are trying to opt out of this. There are still people calling for a moratorium till we know more. Well, the counties that are opting out of it are, for most part, not affected by it or are minimally affected by it. Uh, and so we have traditionally, the state has throughout decades controlled the regulation of natural resources within the state of Illinois. The attempt by areas not affected by this potential job creation uh, to regulate uh, is, a, is an attempt to grab authority from the state of Illinois. Also, I'll say municipalities can ban it currently under the current law. Representative Bradley, we're going to have to close on that note. Thanks very much for your participation. Up next on the program, we will uh, hear a Republican perspective on how the session finally wound down uh, this spring. Up next on the program, we're going to talk with Assistant Senate Republican Leader David Lechtefeld of Oakville and House Republican uh, Caucus Chair Mike Bost of Murfreesboro. Gentlemen, you'll be back in Springfield on June 19th. What's going to happen? You know, I don't know that anything's going to happen. Um, the governor has called us in to deal with pensions. However, uh, the leaders have not got together to actually discuss where we're going with this. And I, I'm afraid that maybe this will be a replay of Rod Bogoyevich over the years of us calling to, him calling us to a special session when there's no compromise or no agreement that's set. And basically Madigan has is, is, is thrown the gauntlet down and said he's not got anything ready for him. It, the uh, governor and the two Democratic leaders, Senate President John Cullerton and Speaker Madigan met uh, uh, on Monday of this week, and uh, the governor has, has thrown out uh, a, a plan, and it goes back to one that uh, Senator Cullerton actually proposed earlier in the spring, and that was run both bills, the House bill that basically makes unilateral cuts, and the Senate bill, which offers retirees and um, uh, current state workers a bit of a choice between their benefits and uh, their cost of living increases as, and their, uh, their health insurance. Well, it'll be interesting to see whether there is agreement between the two, and, and nothing's going to happen unless there is. I know the governor, uh, and so much of what happens in Springfield is about votes and about politics, and I think he felt that he had to do something at least to show that he was trying to make this happen. I'm not real sure where uh, Madigan will be on this issue. Uh, there, there, there was talk this morning of maybe the two trying to get together for some sort of compromise. You know, again, if not, then we're up there for no reason at all. Well, let's talk about the actual mechanics of this. And this was something that uh, the Senate president did put forth a little earlier, but it uh, went off the rails uh, because there was some opposition to it from some of the Republicans. Sure. They they wanted more. You wanted more mm -hmm. of the savings that the House plan would, would right. Would and do. and the why didn't support the plan that that went over from uh, the House. The the Senate plan. Um, the argument is that it does not generate enough in savings. About 48 
billion is what they're talking and everybody says that's a quite high they don't even believe that they will get that out of it based on that with the with the overall hundred and twenty billion uh... that we're in we in debt um, yeah their concerns is is it doesn't reach it or what it does is it does just exactly what the and i don't like to use this term but kick the kick the can down the road and and somebody else will have to deal with it in the future but is a far more the senate plan is a far more politically palatable plan Correct. because all the uh, public employees unions basically got behind that and negotiated that with the senate president it would be a lot easier vote for the democrats and the republicans sure sure and i and i agree that it would be an easier vote the question is does it cure the problem well, there's no question, you know, Cullerton is basically saying this plan is a one that will meet the, the constitutionality. I'm not real sure why it would make a difference as far as the Constitution is concerned if, if employees are giving uh, a choice between two bad choices. Uh, I'm not, I don't see the difference. Uh, again, um, you know, I personally think that we've got a constitutional problem. And, and when that happens, and, and I believe it will, then where do we go? And, and that, that will be a really tough one to solve. Why, why were there no other approaches taken to this? There are a lot of different ideas out there floating around that could have been, could have been uh, put into legislation that didn't cause the uh, heartburn with the, with the possibility of a constitutional question. It depends on which group you're talking to. One group says that uh, um, there's not enough savings. The other group says that it, it isn't constitutional of, of the proposal of changing any benefit that someone is already receiving. And I have to agree, uh, and I think the senator does as well, that that, that is true, that, that that's where we're going to get into some trouble. The other issue is that is trying to figure out a revenue stream that can actually secure the systems for the long run that will not be abused by future legislature. Your, uh, Republic, your Democratic colleague, uh, Lou Lang from Skokie, actually put out the idea uh, earlier in the session of just using the temporary income tax, making that permanent, and using that from here on out. <laughs> of course, the temporary in income tax is supposed to go away, and secondly, uh, it, it, uh, it's gone. I mean, it's being spent right now, um, and in fact, we're in deeper debt now than we were before we passed the income tax. Uh, going in a little into the weeds here, as far as uh, the details of this go, you're 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 in a situation now. You're past the end of May, so you need a three-fifths vote to get anything done. I understand that there's one wrinkle of this that they would postpone or push off right. the effective date of whatever pension plan they. Uh, pass, if they pass, uh, to June 30th of next year so that you don't have to get the super majorities in either House or the Senate. Well, the problem with that is, is that we balanced our budget based on some savings that the pension plan would, by passing some sort of pension reform, would actually uh, make the, the budget work. Of course, we did that last year, and uh, that's the problem that keeps occurring. You can't, even though we project what our revenues are going to be, and try to work off of that and what our expenditures are going to be. If, if we don't find a cure for our pension payments, uh, the budget doesn't work. It doesn't work for higher education or elementary Anywhere. and secondary yeah. public safety. Anywhere. Uh, speaking of the budget, uh, the, the uh, budget is roughly for operations around $35.4 billion that passed out of the House and Senate on Democratic votes. Republicans said they were shut out. The Democrats said, well, you didn't come back with a counter proposal to what we put on the table. No, actually we did. We were actually in the negotiations with them until about three weeks uh, prior. And what occurred was, and, and specifically with higher ed appropriate, we were working in the higher ed appropriate, we began to watch the line items and we began to see, uh, well, members' initiatives is what you would call it if it was your district. We, on the other side, when it's not in your district, we call it pork. And way too many pork projects began to show up. So when we called them out and said, you're reducing this particular, we were, as I said, we were dealing with higher education. You're still reducing uh, the budget for SIU, but yet you're showing this project and then we would call that line item out. Well, once we started calling the line items out, we were no longer invited to the meetings. So then when we came to the floor, it was, oh, well, we were working in a bipartisan manner. Well, we were until all of a sudden we started catching them at what they were doing. You know, you, you and I have talked about this a lot, Jack, not, not only on television but privately. Uh, the fact that for a long, long time the state was headed in any direction that was almost going to bring us into bankruptcy. 
Um, this budget that we do this year doesn't really uh, do anything but just push this down the road. Uh, the budget, we, we, the, we will spend in next year's budget $1.5 billion more than we spent in last year's budget. Uh, it, the longer you push it, the more, the more of a problem it becomes, and, and we're to the point now where it is really, you know, there'll be, whatever, whatever you say, there will be a lot of pain if you're going to solve this. You did get, a, you did get a, about a billion five in extra tax receipts that, that made right. this thing work. Uh, I want to move on to some other questions. Uh, uh, a couple of bills that people were really watching, it, the, the uh, same-sex marriage bill passed out of the Senate uh, with one Republican vote on that bill, as I understand it. it, but it was never called in the House, much to uh, the dismay of a lot of folks who were wanting right. it, it was, to happen. It, it was held out to the last day. Um, the, the sponsor realized he did not have the votes. There were many votes, I believe, that were probably committed uh, from Chicago, uh, that the Ministerial Alliance uh, from downtown Chicago got together and aggressively went into uh, many of the legislators, I think, that had committed, and he saw those votes fall off right at the last, well, at the last two days. Um, so he made a choice to hold off and to try to work it in the uh, veto session. From a tactical standpoint, uh, what was, what do you think about his 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 position on that not calling it i think if it was if it was doomed to failure at the last right I, I don't think he gained anything by calling it and letting it fail i had wondered about that too and and the reason being is there may be those colleagues on his side of the aisle i, I don't think there's any on ours or there are two on ours that have committed to vote for it but basically his situation is is that the districts that they have are swing districts on this issue and it, he basically gave them an out and said you know what let us put our votes together before I ask you for that. Vote. There's also the question of uh, an expanded uh, gaming bill that uh, seemed to be going somewhere until about three weeks till the end of the session when the house sponsor uh, stepped off of that bill because of some concerns uh, and really uh, you had uh, I believe some uh, Cook County wanted a, a share of some things. The city of uh, Chicago wanted a smaller tax rate on it. When did the wheels come off? Well, you know, that, that's happened a lot of years now in, in a row. Uh, and it did, you know, it did pass the Senate, as you know. Uh, the bill gets so big. You know, I, I've always committed to try to help the horsemen. I, you know, that's a part of, of, of the, you know, they, they, they really had a tough time once the boats came in. I mean, they, it sort of collapsed. I uh, wanted to do something to help them. There is, there are some things in this bill that would, but then the bill seems to grow. Everyone wants a piece of it. You know, there are supposed to be certainly the Chicago Casino and then five other casinos. Uh, and then of course the racetracks and, and it just keeps growing to the point where everyone wants a piece of the action. And, and now it, is, it has gotten so big that, um, you know, I don't, I'm going to guess it'll be, it'll be brought back, uh, certainly maybe in the veto session. Whether it finally passes is hard to say, but uh, it, it is a very difficult one because it is so big. We're going to be talking in the next segment about concealed carry. That was one that a lot of downstate lawmakers have been, have been wishing for for a long time, working hard on the bill. Yeah, I've worked on it for 19 years. Uh, uh, both the senator and I watched several colleagues pass away over the years that have worked on it. I can remember late Terry Deering, how important it was to him. We actually came up with what I think is a sensible bill. Uh, it's been sent to the governor. Will the governor veto it? I, I don't know. He, he, there was more than enough votes to override his veto on this one. In both houses. In both houses. And uh, uh, it is a case where we are on a deadline. And so I think we're going to see something. Something by July 9th at least. It has to be. All right. Gentlemen, thanks very much. We really, really appreciate that. Up next on the program, more details on that concealed carry bill. Democratic State Representative Brandon Phelps of Harrisburg has been the House Democrats' point person on concealed carry for how many years now? Eleven. Eleven years. And finally, after eleven years of work and a court decision in your favor, the bill is now on its way to the, uh, Governor Quinn's desk. For our viewers, what exactly is going to be in the concealed carry law as you know it? Well, Jack, first thing, I'm just so proud to be part of history, you know, with this bill because no one ever thought it was going to pass Illinois. But um, this is House Bill 183. It is the concealed carry uh, law. Hopefully the governor will sign it. You have to be 21 years old. You have to have a FOID card to be able to apply. There's a fee in there of $150, which is $30 a, a year for five years. I think that's a very cheap price to be able to protect yourself and your family. 
16 hours of training, but what we did is put eight hours of credit for veterans, and also if you took the hunter safety program, we give you another eight hours of credit for that training. Um, preemption on everything to do with handguns, so any home rule ordinance is thrown out, so that's ammunition, transportation, the registration of a firearm. That was very uh, important and a shall issue. It's a shall issue bill, and that was real important as well. That was, that was the big bone of contention at the end because Chicago was still working very hard, and Cook County working very hard to have some sort of ban on handguns, some sort of sol carving them out, so yeah. to speak. We wiped that away, and we just don't th think that was fair for the law-abiding gun owner because Jack up in Chicago, the, bad, the people with the guns are the bad people and the bad guys, so we just want to be able to protect ourselves from them. One of the more interesting things was a turnabout for House Speaker Mike Madigan. The Speaker has never been a fan of guns over the years, very much like his Senate uh, colleague, uh, Senate President Cullerton. What, what changed his mind, the court decision? I think it was a lot with the court decision. I don't think anybody ever realized we were going to get that kind of, uh, um, the magnitude of that court ruling, you know, a mandate that you say that Illinois has to get something done, that Illinois' ban on concealed carry was unconstitutional. So I think that was the driving, he was the driving force on this and I, and I want to thank him for that. Um, as you were talking about some of the, uh, some of the facets of the bill, uh, the training, uh, where, where can you and where can't you carry under this bill? So we, one thing we did in this bill is allowed you to have as your car a safe harbor. So no matter what, you can have it in your car, you just if you leave the parking lot, you got to make sure it's not in visible sight, but you can't carry in schools colleges and universities, you can't carry in uh, daycare facilities, hospitals, um, bars, uh, just places like that. Also, the city of Chicago wanted to make sure mass transit was protected, mm -hmm. so you can't carry a loaded weapon onto mass transit either. What about restaurants that serve alcohol? So it's 50% of receipts of food. So like at Applebee's, I assume they make more money on food than they do the alcohol, so you could probably carry, you could carry there, I assume, but also the restaurant owners can post a sign if they will allow concealed carry or not. Now I've seen that before in other states like Colorado. Yeah, you right. can, it's, it's kind of optional in that sense. Mm -hmm. It's up to the person uh, who's running the business. It's up to the private owner. Mm -hmm. uh, stronger mental health provisions in this bill than previous uh, yeah. uh, iterations? Yes, strictest in the country. We do not want people that are a harm to themselves and a harm to society to be able to have handguns. And uh, we made sure of that in this bill. One of the big components of this bill is a review panel that is made up of law enforcement, former judges, so mm -hmm. on and so forth, that uh, when, when these applications go in to the state police, all the county, all the local law enforcement will have an opportunity to look these over, right? Yeah, any level of law enforcement can object to a person that they know is a harm to themselves or a harm to society. So they will be objected to, but they still kind of have their day in court. Um, they go in front of this review panel of seven people appointed by the governor, four on no more than one part or the other, so there's some bipartisanship there. But uh, they get to see and kind of more or less tell their case of why they think they need a concealed carry license. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not appealable beyond that? Yeah, and you can appeal. You can be, yeah, you can, you can appeal, appeal through the courts. Okay, you can appeal through yeah, the courts. Right. Um, the Illinois Press Association's come into this kind of late in the game. They have a problem with not being able to see the list of, of, of who's, being, uh, who's applying. That's sensitive personal information, and I hope the Illinois Press Association, all due respect, understands that, because you're talking about uh, very private information for a person that's obje objected to. They're not necessarily wanting to publish it, but if the gun's used in a crime, they want to know if that person was legally licensed to well, carry and we're, it. And we're going to sit down with them, and Jack, that's stuff we can take care of in a trailer bill uh, later on. But you know, one thing right now, we still have a deadline here. I know it was a 30-day extension up to July 9th, right. but we got to get something done. We got to get something done. Now, hopefully, the governor signed. And, and that and that 30-day uh, deadline, uh, according to Attorney General Lisa Madigan, was to give the governor adequate time to look over what had come across his desk. And we feel we feel pretty confident he knows what's in the bill. So I just hopefully he'll sign it because we don't want to go off the cliff. Uh, there's there's some there's some speculation that uh, because of his ardent opposition to uh, conceal carry, that he may try to veto the bill. I hope he doesn't. I hope he doesn't. We still, you know, like I said, we got the deadline. This was an agreed bill by all parties, by the House, by the Senate, by the city of Chicago. And I tell you what, this is a good bill and I'm very proud of it. Well, it, it passed the bill, the, the Senate passed the bill 45 to 12, and I believe it's 90 27 in the House. That's uh, more than a supermajority that it, yeah, you would so need that, to override. Yeah, so that's totally veto proof, Jack, as you know, and I just don't understand why he would want to take that extra time 
uh, you know, unless he playing politics with it, but I hope he does, and this is too important. Uh, what, there, there, was some, there were some other issues that you hope to ca take care of in, in the so-called trailer bills down the line. Uh, what are some of the issues still outstanding that you would like to see done? Well, I'd like to, I'd like to get that hours of training down. I mean, it was nice to get eight hours credit for some of those programs, uh, but I'd like to get the training down a little bit. I also would like to, some of the prohibitive places that you can't carry. I want to kind of work on that too, uh, but that's something we can do later. What about reciprocity with other states? Absolutely. Absolutely, uh, I would, I'm huge with reciprocity. Um, the uh, speaker didn't want to allow that right now, just because this is new to Illinois, and that's something we're going to revisit later. So you can nibble around the margins after the, afterwards. Representative Phelps, thanks very much for your participation. We always appreciate that. That is it for this special edition of Illinois Lawmakers. You can uh, find out more about the program at IllinoisLawmakers.org.